come share this with a friend, family member, loved one, co-worker, someone you know who needs to hear this message from God, who needs to be encouraged today. Um, continue to join us. Continue to tap in and stay tuned because we have some amazing things coming up within our ministry and we can't wait to just worship with you all. So enjoy, sit back, and let us exalt his name together. Amen.
everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ashley. I'm here to bring the announcements for this week. Um, this week we are doing corporate prayer and fasting. That is Monday, 7 p.m. through till Tuesday at 7 p.m. During that time, we're going to be praying for the ministry, praying for the community, um, praying for our local government and uh, the schools with decision making. Um, at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, we're going to have corporate Bible study. Um, We'd love for you to join us with that. The information is at the link below. Um, we've been really focusing on the attributes of God, loving, faithful, merciful. Um, we'll continue that discussion together Tuesday at 7 p.m. Um, and then Wednesday at 1 p.m. on our YouTube channel, we have midweek prayer. As you join us Wednesday at 1 p.m., you can drop any prayer requests in our chat. Um, and then on Friday, we have story time with Miss Myrna. That is at 1 p.m. Um, bring your kiddos, and she'll read a story, answer some questions um, as far as teaching the Bible to them, and giving. We would love for you to consider giving to our ministry. Um, we are very committed to serving the community, in the community, on the streets, um, Ward 7, um, and the folks that live in the Huff neighborhood. That takes resources. So please consider giving to this ministry. Anything that you're able to give could really help us out to continue to serve um, the folks in our community. Um, please stick around for worship and the final message of the Be Still series. Thank you so much. Bye.
Well, today we get to finish up uh, this mini series that we were in called uh, Be Still. Um, so, um, we'll have a little bit of fun maybe here. Um, but we've been in a series where we've been kind of looking at um, these different uh, passages in the Bible where we see either be still uh, or where we see this word be silent. And we've been just looking at different situations where we can apply to our own lives, things that's been happening in our own lives, uh, where, where we can apply the concept of trusting in God's authority, trusting in God's power, uh, despite what's going on. And so uh, that was kind of the heartbeat of this series. And so as we end this series, uh, we're going to be looking at Psalms chapter four. And in Psalms chapter four, David says, uh, be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. And so as we end this series, we're going to continue to talk about being still uh, from the subject of being still and being confident being still and being confident and so when I talk about being confident I'm talking about uh, being confident in the actual process of being still so if being still means trusting the authority of God if being still means trusting in the power of God then being confident in that is having full belief full boldness full something in the fact <laughs> that I can be still um, in God. So it's kind of like, like when I'm working with my son and he's working on his letters and he, and I'm, I'm the, I shouldn't, I'm, they go back to school on the first, I, I'm a traumatizing teacher. Um, I have no business teaching children. I don't endure the patience at all it's not my gifting um and so they get to go back to school and you know I pray that he likes school when he goes back and that I didn't do too much damage <laughs> during this quarantine but it's like he comes in and he's doing his letters and and he mumbles the, the mumbles it man or or I'll say something to him and he gets like all timid and like puts his head down and walks away and I always my wife <laughs> she'll witness to it I always look at him and and you know yell at him and be like, dude, if you don't put your head up and walk with your head up, you know, and 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 that's because like I grew up, like I grew up, my dad was literally not <laughs> traumas of a black family. <laughs> not, this is not right, but you know, I grew up, my dad would punch me in my chest if I was walking around looking at the ground. Like, man, if you don't pick your head up when you walk, and 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 so when my son's just doing that. It aggravates me because I'm like, have some confidence. It's G. Say G. No, G, G. no just G. Have some confidence in, in, in what you're saying. But the reason that he doesn't have confidence, the reason we don't have confidence sometimes is because we're not certain. We're uncertain if the answer is like, if you, it's like when, um, and Coretta does these, uh, well, Coretta and Autumn, they do these posts and these like ask questions posts, right? And so you, you put it up and like nobody wants to be the first to comment to the Bible question because nobody wants to be wrong, right? Because they're like, well, I think I know, but I'm not so certain. But when you lack certainty, uh, you lack confidence. And a lack of confidence is going to show, especially in the, when we're talking about God, a lack of confidence is going to show that we really don't believe that we can be still or we really don't believe or really haven't leaned into the fact that we can be still when it comes to trusting in God. And so I want to tell us that today when we talk about being still, as we uh, take all of the messages with us as we go, um, the one thing I want us to never forget is that when it comes to trusting God, we must learn to walk in confidence. When it comes to trusting in God, we must learn uh, to walk in confidence. And what amazes me is, is, is how confident the world is. Like, the world is absolutely confident in the things that they trust in. 
They don't care about posting it, telling you you wrong, telling you you need to come over here. The world is very confident about the things that they trust in, the things that they believe that works. And 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 but we as believers, we walk around, you know, I don't I don't, don't want to offend nobody. I don't you know, we get so timid. Everybody's confident in their stuff. But then we who have the actual power of God, we're walking around with melt confidence. And it shows in the fact that we synchronize the world's values and views with our own. And I know y'all like this brother, the last three weeks he's talking about this syncretism. Yes, because we do it too much. <laughs> right? We, we Christ am because we're uncertain that if we put all of our eggs in one basket, we won't, we won't get let down. And so even our trusting God becomes uncertain. Even our trusting God becomes uncertain. However, confidence presumes strength. Confidence is necessary if we desire to endure hardships and peace. Confidence is necessary if we desire to endure hardships in peace. Not and peace, but in peace. Because you can go through hardships without peace, or you can go through hardships in peace. But the only way to go through hardships in peace is you must have confidence. Why? Because confidence presumes strength. It expresses stability and boldness. And during hardships and the chaos of our lives, we need strength. We need to be planted and we need to be able to face the storms of our life with boldness. Which, And the reason we need to be able to face the, the storms of our life with boldness is because boldness counteracts fear. Boldness counteracts fear. Boldness allows us to look our situation that is terrifying, that is horrifying, and to approach it without fear, to be bold in the midst of it. But let's be very clear. Our confidence can't be in ourselves. The confidence can't be in our own abilities. Our confidence can't be in man's solution. Our confidence must be, has to be, needs to be in God. And this doesn't mean that, that God doesn't use these other things, right? It doesn't mean that God doesn't use these other things. It just simply means that we don't put our confidence in these things. Instead of putting our confidence in these things, these things aren't our confidence. God is. It's like you can get the, uh, the, the little four-way to change a tire, right? Or I can get, you can get a ratchet, right? And you can change a tire. It's a tool. It works. But imagine if I give that four-way to my five-year-old son and I say, hey, go out there with this tool and change the tire. Well, the tool works. Nothing's wrong with the tool, but my son, unless the dude is like a super freak or something, is not going to be able to get those nuts off that tire in order to change that tire. It doesn't matter if he has the right tool. He doesn't have the strength in order to actually do it, right? And so what we have to understand as though these things are tools they're only tools, but tools are ineffective if there's not the right strength behind it. If the person using the tool does not have the ability or the power to actually accomplish what the, 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 the task is, it doesn't matter what tool you use. My son doesn't have enough strength, no matter how, what tool I give him, he doesn't have enough strength for the tool to actually be effective. And that's the way everything in life is. It doesn't matter what, what, what your job is, it's a tool. But the tool can't actually provide the things that you need to be provided if God is not behind the tool actually providing it. Right? And too often we put our confidence in the tool not understanding that the tool means nothing without God. Right? My job is a tool for resources. My family, friends, marriage is a tool for companionship. But we should never put our confidence in a tool. We put our confidence in the strength of the one using the tool. It, it, it's why I, when I go to the gym and it's, I need to do a heavy lift, I search to find the right person to spot me. Right? And, and the reason I'm looking is because I'm, I'm trying to find somebody that I know can actually at least handle the amount of weight, because I've either seen them do it. But I'm looking for somebody that I feel like is strong enough to actually handle the weight, because it's not just about spotting. Anybody can get behind you and spot you. But I need somebody who's strong enough to actually help me if I'm unable to actually push the weight. Right? See, our confidence is not in the tools that God uses. Our confidence is in him. And many of us get that wrong. 
Our confidence we put in the tool, forgetting that it's God operating the tool that allows the tool to be effective in our life, right? I can be still because I have confidence in who God is, not anything else. And Psalms 4 is a hymn of great confidence. David, who wrote many psalms during his many lives of trouble, if you know the man, the man was, even though he was a king, the brother had a pretty tormented life. That brother was always running, on the run from Absalom, on the run from Saul. The brother was always running, hiding in the cave, right? Like, um, David was the, he was the most disrespected king. I don't, that brother was, he was, I don't, David was always on the run. That's why all his psalms, he, he's lamenting. <laughs> Like, the brother's life was crazy. He wrote many psalms during many of his life's afflictions, and, 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 and <laughs> which is actually something to talk about on another day because these psalms of praise and worship he's writing in the midst of constant chaos in his life. And, and, and so Psalms 4 is no different. David, once again, is distressed. He's being pursued by his enemies. And listen, his enemies weren't looking to capture him. They were looking to kill him. All right, so this isn't like a little or light situation, right? David is expressing a prayer of confidence, a confidence that, 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 that I can only hope to pray in the face of the type of trials that David was in, a confidence that I can only hope that you guys would pray in the face of the trials and discouragements that David faced, a confidence um, that I pray we all walk away from this series with, um, believing that God will deliver, believing that God would vindicate, believing that God will bring relief for us, just like David had the confidence that in his situation, God will bring relief for him. And if I'm honest, this is something that many of us stop believing. Right? And I say it every week. We start with it. But time kills it. The gravity of the situation kills it. Many of us have confidence in God, but then we struggle to keep it. Right. And David's no different than you and I. So how did David, who's no different than you and I, maintain such confidence in the midst of his storms? Well, this may seem like it ain't the right answer. It may seem too simple. But the first reason is because he had to. <laughs> David remained confident in the midst of his storms because he had no other choice but to. See, David got to this place uh, with God where he came to understand that nothing else was going to work. He understood that the sword wasn't going to work. He understood that the army wasn't going to work. His position, his office wasn't going to work because he's had all of it, tried all of it, and yet he still is on the run. So what else can you do but trust God? And so when people look at you and they say, how can you still trust God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you say, because I tried everything else and it failed. Right. So so if I don't trust God, what else do I have? That's why things have failed many people's lives, but they refuse to put trust in God. And so they remain hopeless. So I can choose to be hopeless or I can choose. Listen, I, I don't have no choice but to put my you failed me. <laughs> my job laid me off. So it failed me. My relationship didn't work. So it failed me. So if I'm it, the drugs wear off and I just need some more, so it's failing me. The alcohol has failed me. The sexual addiction failed me. So I have nothing left. And David got to that place where he said, listen, I don't, I don't have no other choice but to trust God. David has to have confidence in God because he's learned that everything else failed him. And so he says this, answer me, verse 1, when I call Oh, God of my righteousness. And, and, and this, this word answer means to respond, right? But not just to respond, not just to pick up the phone, but to respond in what I'm asking you to do. And so David's like, yo, answer me when I call, oh, God of my righteousness, right? And what I love about this is he didn't say, yo, mom, pick up the phone. He didn't say, hey, dad, pick up the phone. He didn't say, best friend, pick up the phone. He didn't say in his financial problems, hey, boss, pick up the phone. I need to work overtime. He didn't call for his generals and his army in the midst of his thing. He said, answer me when I call you, God. Right? He doesn't have confidence in anything else but God. And so he calls on God, the one who he can put his trust in, the one who he's called on before, the one who has proven that in the midst of all of his problems, he's the one who's able to help him in hardships and distress. And listen, which is what I want to say. Who you call first says something about who you trust. So who do you call? 
the moment something goes down in your life. <laughs> Somebody present said Ghostbusters. Listen, who do you call when you have things going on in your life? And listen, I'm just going to be honest with you guys. And I know I say a lot of stuff that seems kind of weird, kind of seems like I'm just trying to get out of my job, right? But listen, it soothes my ego, but if I'm your first call, your confidence is misplaced. Right? If your best friend is your first call, regardless of how sanctified or holy you think they are, your confidence is misplaced. Right? And I'm not saying don't call them. I'm just saying if they're your first call, you got it wrong because your first call better be God. And I'm going to tell you a secret. And this is God's honest truth. When you call me, you're talking to me. I probably miss the first 45 to 60 seconds of the phone call. Because while you're talking, I'm silently praying. God, I have no clue how I'm going to help this person. So please <laughs> tell me some words <laughs> to say. <laughs> I don't even know what's about to happen. So I'm about to start, I'm going to start listening now. And hopefully you're going to show up because I don't even know what to say anyway. So even if you call me, you're getting God's answer anyway. And it may be best if you just call him first. That's why they'd be like, did you hear me? Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> I was listening to God, man, so I could answer you more effectively. So if you don't want the first 60 seconds of your conversations with me to not be heard, you should call God first. And Yeah. And I definitely would pray with you because I don't be knowing. I'd be like, I don't know. Let's just pray. We'll see. Let's pray about it. It's <laughs> the best answer I got for you. If that ain't good enough for you, I'm sorry. Right? But listen. David says, answer the phone, God. And what that tells me is in the midst of our chaos and trouble, the most important thing that we need is for God to pick up the phone. And don't misplace that, right? We would like me to pick up the phone. We like our boss to pick up the phone. You like your therapist to pick up the phone, right? These things, these people, we would like to pick up the phone, but we need God to pick up the phone, right? And I love the word picture here because it's that sense of urgency. It's that it's that it's that back to back phone call. Like do do do, they ain't pick up. Hang right up. Back to back, and then you know you pacing when you call. I'm like come on man, pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up. I need you right. And the reason that angst and that urgency is because there's a situation that you're in, and you believe they're the one that can help you. So if you lost your keys and you and only, there's only one key right in the house, and you need the key. And you calling the person, you, you anxious, you need them to pick up the phone because you because you like, yo, you're the one that can fix this situation, right? And so the anxiousness, the urgency behind answer your phone is because I believe you're the only one that can fix this problem. So it should be interesting to us that the one that David is anxious and urgent to pick up the phone is God. And we love to say that David was a man after God's own heart when it comes to our moral failures. But why don't we love his heart when it comes to his dependency on God? Right? We should also want to mimic his heart when it comes to acknowledging who we should be going to in our chaos and our struggles. And with the same ancient urgency, redial and redial until you get Jesus on the main line so you can tell him what you want. Right? Listen. That's the remix. And the reason is because Jesus is our preeminent helper. Preeminent meaning surpassing, distinguished, right? Right? And that's the, can't nobody do me like G, can't nobody do me like the Lord can, right? That's why they say that stuff. Because they realize that, listen, there's a lot of helpers. <laughs> but there's no preeminent helper but Jesus. He surpasses all of the help and he's distinguished beyond all of the help, meaning he can do things that no human being, no, 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 no prayer cloth, no healing oil, no crystal, no nothing can do. Jesus. And David understood that this situation could not be fixed by anybody else but God. David acknowledges that the person we should be calling is God, is Christ. Because the one thing about him is we don't have to think about if he can assist us. We know he has the power. You know the other worst thing? I don't know if you're anything like me. I'm, pray for me. Sometimes I, he just pray for me. But I think you like this too, so pray for yourself as well. 
You know what's really bad? When you call a person and you think they can help you, and they can't. But they want to keep talking. I, you, I, gotta, I need to call somebody who can help me. I thought you, you can't, okay, hey, I'm going to call you back. But no, but I'm not, you can't, can you help? I can't, right? It is no worse feeling than call, especially when you've been waiting on them to pick up the phone, and then they finally pick up the phone, and they're like, no, I don't got the key. Insider. Only, only some people know this, right? <laughs> and you be like, you can't even help me. I didn't spend all this time redialing and redialing, and then you can't even help me. But listen, but listen, when it comes to Jesus, we, are, we can be confident that he is the one that can't. We don't have to guess if he has the solution. We can know that he has the collusion. You know how I choose my spotter in the gym? I don't just guess. I don't look and be like, well, mm, maybe he can help. No, no, no. I look for people that I've seen move that type of weight before. I look for people that I, okay, well, he, he's benched this, so he can clearly, because listen, if I got 360 pounds over my chest, if I got close to 500 pounds, I don't need to guess that if I miss this, you can help me or not. I need to know that you have the power. I need to have confidence that you can help me, right? And Jesus is the one that we should be going to knowing, not guessing, knowing that he is the one who can help us. David acknowledges this by calling on God. And by calling on God, he, he, he says, I know, I'm not guessing that you have the power. And this is why he calls on God of my righteousness. He says, answer your phone, oh God of my righteousness. And to get a clearer picture of why that is an affirmation of God's ability to save him, we see in Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely. He shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In the days of Judah, we will be saved. Pay attention. In the days of Judah, we will be saved, and Israel shall dwell in security, or shall dwell securely. And this is by the name, and this is the name by which he will be called. Who's going to be called? The person who's going to come from uh, David's uh, branch. The person who's going to reign as king. The person who's going to deal wisely. The person who's going to execute justice. The one who's going to save Judah. The person who's going to secure Judah. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And so when David says, answer the phone, O God of my righteousness, he is affirming by that title that you are the God who can save us. He is speaking to him saying, answer the phone, the God who will save us, the God who will uh, allow me to dwell securely. And we'll see that at the end of this psalm when he says, I dwell in security. And the title that he calls God is associated with delivering power and the saving power of God. And so David wasn't anxious to call on God for the sake of calling on God. He was anxious for calling on God because he understood him to be the one who can deliver, save, and vindicate. In other words, answer me, God, who can save. Side note, 1 Corinthians 1.30 tells us that Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is... Our righteousness. And it's a lot of times we just make that about, you know, he, he made me righteous, imputed his righteousness upon me. But I think it goes beyond that. Jesus is our righteousness is another title to say that Jesus is the one who saves us. Jesus is the one who vindicates us. Jesus is the one that we can trust and call on, the one who will allow us to dwell securely, the one who is our security. And so Jeremiah 23 is talking about Jesus. And we know that, too, because he know he's the branch that comes from Jesse's root anyway, right? <laughs> But the reason David is anxious and the reason that we must be anxious and, and, and urge and with this urgency for God to answer is because God is our savior. God is our deliverer, our vindicator, our healer and our comforter. His righteousness to all of us is the solution to all of our problems. But we'll never make that declaration that David made. We never have the confidence that David made without experiencing the hand of God. See, this declaration of righteousness is not simply cognitive. See, I'm going to start where I, I'm going to end where I started. This declaration is not simply cognitive. It's not because the preacher said it. It's not because the Bible said it. In fact, understand this. The Bible is a book of lived experiences that teach us about God, 
Right. And so we're reading his lived experience. We're reading his we're, we, we've read God saving him. And so then when he speaks with the confidence of his ability to save him, we're reading a response to his lived experiences. But it's not because the preacher said it or he heard it through the grapevine. David declared with confidence that God is his salvation because he experienced much trouble in his life. But he's also experienced God's salvation in all of those troubles in his life. And so he says, uh, answer when I call, O God of my righteousness, you have given me relief. Past tense. When I was in distress. Past tense. Right. He's anchoring this confidence in the fact that. I don't believe that you lost your power. I don't believe that you're a different God, right? You answer me and save me. You gave me relief before when I was in distress. You, 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 you saved me before when I was in distress. And so if you remember message one, we talked about that. Cognitive knowledge is received through books, preaching, studying, while experiential knowledge or empirical knowledge is received through the senses by experience. We need experiential knowledge over simply having cognitive knowledge and so the confidence in God's ability to relieve us in hardships and chaos is going to be anchored in past experiences and, 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 and it's a fact that David knows that God relieved him from his former distress and in and, and distress by the way for him is these are some actual people right but distress just holds the sense it could be mental physical social economical Right. So so you can be distressed economically. You can be distressed socially. You can be distressed mentally. You can be distressed physically. David is dealing with very real people on his heels. Right. On the run from Absalom. But 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 your distress may be different. It may be people. It may be mental distress. It may be the fact that you're not accepted in society. It may be that economically you're you're you're, you're oppressed. It could I don't it, whatever it's distress. Right. And but 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 David is acknowledging that whatever your distress is, God is the one that we need to answer when we call. David knows where his help comes from because he's walked through the valley of the shadow of death and God was with him. Okay, that's not your story. But you was in jail and God released you. Okay, that's not your story. You were in bondage to sexual impurity. Okay, that's not your story. You 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 were addicted to drugs, alcohol, opioids, pornography. Right. Whatever your story is. Right. We can say most of us watching that we're not that. <laughs> we can say that I was that. But then God saved me. We can we when we celebrate our de- our, our, our day to sobriety, we're, we're celebrating the fact that God delivered us from something. When you celebrate celibacy, you're celebrating the fact that God delivered you from something. Right. We all are testimony allows us to celebrate, right? And, and, and the point is that those of us who have walked with God, called on God, we have experienced him work, and the same guy that did it before has not lost his power. And so David says, I have, and you can have the same confidence knowing that God who did it once will do it again. But here's something about our confidence. We must not allow time to deteriorate confidence. See, being still doesn't require just confidence. It requires a persevering confidence, right? And so we must not allow time to deteriorate our confidence. And what do I mean? Well, well, not only is David anxious for God to answer, but he's anxious because it appears that this situation has been going on for a while. He says in verse 2, O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? Now, the question of how long indicates that this situation, whatever it is, has been going on for a long time. For us, let me put it in, let me put it in in, in black parent subtitles. Um, How many times do I got to tell you? (laughs) Right. When When the parents say, how many times do I have to tell you? The implication is I've been telling you. (laughs) And when David is saying how long the implication and it's been long. It's been enough. You have been dishonoring my name. You have loved vain words and speaking lies about me. He's not asking them a question. Literally, he's 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 speaking a truth about the situation. And he's saying this situation has been going on for a long period of time. And this is exactly where the enemy starts to twist stuff. Right. 
The time span or the longevity of our situation is when the enemy comes in and starts to deteriorate our confidence. Starts to cause us to think that God can't really save us. But notice that the confidence of David in verse 1 is during the distress that's been lingering for a while. David speaks confidence in the midst of a lasting situation. In other words, he never allowed his confidence to shift from confident in God to unsure. He has not moved on from believing that God is still the one he needs. And how quickly we forget, though. How quickly we give God, you got three days to answer me. That's like, you. that's a typical, you know, I'm going to pray on this for three days. But what if he don't answer in three days? God, if you don't answer in three days, I'm going to go ahead and do it my way. Okay, your grave. I don't know if God is saying that, you know, but that's my response. Well, I mean, that's all you're giving him. <laughs> and if he don't answer, you're just going to do your, 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 your destruction. We move on so quickly from the confidence we said we had in Christ. But confidence in God's deliverance should never be fleeting. Confidence in God's deliverance should never be fleeting. Many, meaning this, at the start of the storm, in the middle of the storm, at the end of the storm, our confidence should remain the same. If we're truly being still, our confidence should remain the same. And understand, I understand that we have ebb and flow. I understand that it ebbs and flows in our, in our, in our confidence and being still, that sometimes we, we're high in confidence, sometimes we're low in confidence. I understand that. However, we should be working. Well, I'm going to change that. I'm just going to tell you how to reduce some of that ebb and flow. Okay? Because I don't want to justify it. The, re, the way we can keep the confidence that David had is by doing what David did. And what David did was he didn't get God amnesia. Instead, he anchored his confidence in his past experiences with God. The way that we maintain confidence, even, in long, even when a t- trial is lingering, is we have to anchor that confidence in our past experiences with God. This is what David is doing. It it, it does us no good to get uh, amnesia as believers in hard times. Remembering the goodness of God is what keeps our confidence. Right. It's the the entire reason why he put all the feast in place for Israel. They were feasts for them to remember the things that he did for them. And if you read your Bible, it should be very interesting to you that every time they dealt with something very difficult in life, even when the psalmist is dealing with something, even when the prophets is dealing with the nations and their issues, it should be very interesting to you that the one thing they always go back to is the Exodus. And the reason they always go back to the Exodus is because they anchor their belief in God's ability to deliver them in the fact that he delivered them from, at that moment, the worst thing they had experienced in life. 430 years. And God showed up and delivered them in a mighty way. And so no matter what's going on in their life, if they're going into Babylonian captivity, Isaiah chapter 43, when you go through the waters, I'll be with you. When you go through the fires, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, I'll be with you, right? They are anchoring every experience that they're going through in what God did in Exodus in order to maintain their confidence in his ability to deliver them. In the same way, we must anchor our confidence, not in just what somebody wrote in the text, but we must anchor our confidence in the fact that we went through something with God and he brought us out. It's what Psalms 143.5 says. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the works of your hands. It's not just remembering. It's meditating. It's pondering. It's, it's talking to yourself. God, I remember last year when I was in a dark place and you brought me out. God, I remember that 2014 was a, was a very uh, 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 trying time in, in the Tanks family. But I remember how you used that tragedy and turned it to victory. Therefore, in this situation, I am fully confident that you can use this to get the glory. When you you're going through some things, you got to start talking to yourself. Woo, this thing is kicking my butt, but God, I remember when it was kicking my butt two years ago, and I didn't understand how I was going to get on my situation, but you showed up in a crazy way. We got to learn how to affirm God's goodness in our life. We affirm everything else in our life but the goodness of God. You want to do some affirmations, affirmate that. Trust in the presence, second, second, trust in the presence of God, even when the situation is lasting. 
It's the second way that we maintain that confidence. We have to trust in the presence of God even when the situation is lasting. The psalmist is still calling on God because he is still acknowledging that God is both listening and near. And that's what we talked about last week. He's both present and able. Right. We quote, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. Right. But when difficulties and seasons get longer, it, it has to be more than just advice to other people in a mess. We need to actually embrace it ourselves. Lastly, remember that God does not remain silent or inactive in the face of our hardships, even though it feels like that. We have to remember that he does not remain silent or inactive. Psalms 50 and three, our God comes. He does not keep silent. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest, tempest. The declaration is that God is not silent, but he's working. And we must remember that even when we can't audibly hear him, know that he is very much active in our situation. God is not being silent. He's working uh, the whole situation out. And when the time comes to act in the physical, he will. But he always hears. He's always working. Therefore, we must keep our confidence in him. And that is faith. That is trust. And also, let me add that how long also expresses that it won't be much longer. See, see, at first it's how long, old man? In other words, how many times I got to t- Okay, that's one way, right? But it also expresses it won't be much longer, right? right? It's kind of like, like when, when the mom says, like, how many times do I have to tell you? What that means is I ain't about to keep telling you. I'm about to start showing you. <laughs> it's, 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 the, it's the letting you know it's been going on for a long time, but it's coming to an end. Right? In the same way, the psalmist is warning them, how long do you think you're going to keep getting away with afflicting me, oppressing me, lying on me? And what I love about this is it exudes confidence, and this confidence is mimicable. Have enough confidence in God to remind your situation that it ain't got many more. Have enough confidence to, in God to remind your situations that it ain't got many more times. Have enough confidence in God to remind your situations that it ain't got many more times. Okay, you ain't catch it. Let me put it in subtimes, I, subtitles. I ain't going to be too many more of your. <laughs> yeah, keep talking. Y- y'all get with me now. Yeah, y'all got it. It's a warning. I'm putting you on notice. Listen, you ain't got too many more times to come out your mouth crazy to me. Right? This is what David is also saying to his enemies. How long? And I, hey, how, <laughs> but I'm about to tell you. It won't. Okay, you don't believe me? Verse 3. How long? <laughs> but know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself, and the Lord hears me. When I call, he said, yo, how long you going to do all this? But, hey, you need to know God has set apart the godly for himself, and he hears me. In other words, hey, don't forget the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. Said it backwards, but y'all with me? He hear me. <laughs> right? Because y- y'all know y'all don't really mess with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Everybody know that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the baddest God on the planet. And just in case you didn't know, he hear me too. I'm putting you on notice. You better chill. Right? And that's not a boast in self. That's a boast in God because God protects those who belong to him. And this is something that we must never forget. David says the reason that he is confident that his enemies won't get over for long is because he's been set apart from God for himself. And that word set apart is where we get that New Testament word saint. Right? It's also what the church means, the called out and set apart of God. Which, side note, is completely weird then why saints try to synchronize with secular by definition we're enemies <laughs> by definition of what a saint is I'm called out of the secular <laughs> by definition we're not friends so if God called me out of the secular why is the church trying to figure out how to be best friends with the secular I don't want to go back into the secular I just want to be in the same block with them, same room with them. However, get real close to them. <laughs> Call it evangelism. <laughs> I petty. It's synchronizing again. But being a saint carries with it the protection of God. Psalm 37, 28, for the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. 
They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. If it's the saints of God who God protects and the wicked who he cuts off, David reminds his situation that, uh, that you are messing with the saint a child of God, and understand uh, the people who are coming against him, understand the power of God, of the God of Israel. But also understand that while David's situation is very real people, understand that we have a very spiritual enemy who understands the power of Yahweh. And so when we tell our spiritual enemy, Satan, and all of his little minions, uh, that, that, listen, the God of Yahweh, the God of Israel, hears me, they also understand, and that means, hold on, we need to back off, right? You're not some throwaway. You're, you're set apart of God, meaning he will protect, he will deliver, he will vindicate, and it also means that he, that he hears you. Again, reminding us that he is present and working. This is our confidence in the midst of chaos. It's not our strength. It's, it's God's love and protection for his children. So we look at our problems in life and face, and, and we declare with confidence, you won't win. How long will you continue to come against me, a child of God? I ain't going to be too many more, yo. And say it with your chest when you say it, by the way. Head up, chest up. Don't, don't let the word trail off. <laughs> be confident when you tell your situation, you ain't got much longer to keep messing with me. Right? Look it dead in the eye. Beat your chest. King Kong ain't. We need to have that type of seriousness that when we speak to our problems, and I'm not talking all of that spookism stuff, but what I am talking about is that when we speak the authority of God to our problems and we look at our situations and we say, I am a child of God, you will not win. You need to say that with enough confidence that the enemy don't look back at you and say, you don't even believe that. Make him believe it. The point is exude confidence in the power of God over your situation. Then he says, be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Say lie, offer right uh, 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 sacrifices and put your trust in God. And this passage becomes very interesting. Because on one side, you can look at it as David is telling his problems to not let, the, not let anger cause them to sin against God by coming against God's child. Instead, think of the warning of God and, and that he'll vindicate his children and be silent. Don't do whatever you was going to do to me. Right? But on the other side, it's David telling us that in light of our confidence that we have in God's ability to protect us, not to allow our situations to cause us to act in anger and sin. Remember last week we talked about that. Frustration can cause us, uh, envy and arrogance right, can cause us to get frustrated in sin. So he can be saying, listen, don't let your situation cause you to act in anger and sin. Instead, meditate on God and his word and be still or silent and do not respond in anger. And I think both is applicable. But for us, I want to stress we must remain patient in the affliction. Patience is a fruit of the spirit. Patience is a virtue and patience is the observable witness of faith and trust in God. Let me say that again. Patience is the observable witness and faith and trust in God. And what David is saying that whatever you got going on in anger or frustrated or being tired, don't do whatever you want to do in response to it. Instead, be patient. And I get it. It's hard to be patient in suffering. It's a hard thing. But patience is what keeps us making from make, uh, patience is what keeps us from making the wrong moves, saying the wrong things, and it's the observable evidence of trust. I don't understand it always. I don't know why God likes to take forever sometimes, but I'm waiting, but I'm waiting in the right way, right? Until the day of my salvation comes near to me, I wait in the right way, and therefore, I make the right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. Now, here's the cool thing when he says make the right sacrifices. Right. It, it, it could be two things. It could be live right because the right sacrifices aren't ceremonial. Um, but also, I don't know if you understand that whenever nations had always had their gods and when they were going into battle, when they needed favor, they would make sacrifices to their gods. Right. And, 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 and so whenever they wanted to win in the battle, whenever they wanted favor, whenever they, they, they needed assistance, whenever they needed to hear from their God, they would make sacrifices to their God. Every nation would use sacrifices to call on their God for favor and help. And so David is, this is cool, David is calling both the world and the saints to make the right sacrifices and the right sacrifice is to sacrifice to the true God. If you want favor, if you need his assistance, make sure that you're not sacrificing to the wrong God. 
right? And, and, and this is not saying go get a goat, but the point is seek God and trust in him. Too many people just start sacrificing to all the guys looking for relief, meaning that, that the saints are, of God are turning to everything else to help us in our solutions. And for the record, this does not mean that you don't need to go talk to a therapist, but it does mean don't make your therapist your God. Right. If you trust in your therapist, uh, uh, if you trust in your therapist to saving you uh, instead of God, then you're sacrificing to the wrong God. If you trust in your job to provide for you and not God, you're sacrificing to the wrong God. If you trust in your relationship to solve your loneliness and emptiness, you're sacrificing to the wrong God. If you're trusting, uh, 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 again, in your job to provide for you instead of God being the one providing for you, then you're sacrificing to the wrong God. The problem is too many of us are making sacrifices, but we're making sacrifices to the wrong God seeking favor. So every time we turn to the world for favor, we're sacrificing to the world's gods. But the God that we must be sacrificing to when we want favor, the God that must, we must be sacrificing to when we need deliverance, it has to be the one and true God, the God of Yahweh, of Israel, Yahweh. In all of our situations, who are we sacrificing to? Meaning, who are we seeking for favor and relief? I'm reminded of the account of 1 Kings with Elijah. And they was all over there. Get your guys together. You get your guys together, do your sacrifices together, do what you do. And when you get done, let me know. I'll be over here. They over there, they hoop hobbling, hot hobbling, all types of stuff over there. Just cutting themselves, the babbling all crazy. They, they God ain't none of them hearing nothing. Right, right. Like, yeah, Eliza, he, and Eliza, and Eliza is a, listen, Eliza, a cold stone troll. <laughs> that brother was troll. <laughs> he was, Eliza is the definition of a biblical troll. That brother was in there like, maybe he can't hear you. Maybe they sleep. Right? <laughs> and then at the end of it all, after all of they did, are you, you done? He said, all right, cool. What did he do? He rebuilt an altar. And he made sacrifice to the one and true God. And the, and the fire came down, consumed all of it. And then he gathered up all the prophets of Baal and no more prophets of Baal. <laughs> but it's because he sacrificed to the right. They were sacrificing to the wrong gods trying to get favor. And Elijah sacrificed to the right God. And because he sacrificed to the right God, the right God showed up. We need God to show up in our lives, but we keep sacrificing to these gods of the world. Make the right sacrifice. And when you make the right sacrifice, what you're saying is, I trust in God. The world got its remedies. It got its methods. And too many of us as saints are not being still in God. We're being still in their methods. And the reason is because we don't truly believe that if we don't, that if we put all our eggs in one basket, we think we really might lose out. And so we say, well, I'll put one egg over here, <laughs> just in case I got an egg. <laughs> and then the Bible says, there are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us. Oh, Lord, you have put more joy in my heart than you have when their grain and wine abound. The face of God in hardship is more valuable than material relief. As we close, the psalmist says, many people look to you for good. Right? They're in the middle of hardship. He's telling them, I have confidence in God. He's telling them, this will not last. How long? Listen, you better chill. My God going to show up. He tells them to make the right sacrifice. Let's trust in God. Don't allow the, the, everything that you're going, on, uh, going through in life to cause you to start sacrificing to the wrong God, trying to get favor. Trust in the God of Yahweh. Trust, I mean, trust in the God of Israel, Yahweh, for he is the one that can give you favor. And then he says, by the way, many will say, show us some good. In other words, here, here's what he's saying. In the midst of the, our hardships, in the midst of confidence, and I mean, in, in the midst of distress, the one thing that we look for sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, sometimes is instead of the right relief from God, we just look for some good in it. But, and what I mean by some good in it is retail therapy, food, sex, drugs, alcohol, violence, isolation, right? Hey, show us just some good. Listen, I, I, I don't know if I'll get full deliverance, but just let me just get a little good. Let me feel a little better. 
You know, all those things that we do to make ourselves feel better in our hardships. We start going, and I'm <laughs> me guilty. Right? The minute I get stressed, I'm to the gym. I gotta go to the gym. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta lift this out. <laughs> I, feel, I don't think about it while I'm lifting, then I get back in my car. <laughs> it's like, oh, problem's still here. <laughs> right? The psalmist says in the midst of hard times, you can seek good things or you can seek the face of God. And the face of God shining on us is grace and peace and favor. Number six, 24 and 26. And this is where they got the song from, right? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his face towards you and give us peace. (laughs) The psalmist is saying while people are searching for good or prosperity to mass good to to give them a sense of feeling good he says no what you really need is the face of God and the reason you need the face of God to shine upon you is because when the face of God shines upon you he puts more joy in our hearts than their grain and wine when it harvests he says the reason we should be seeking God's face over anything else is because the presence of God gives a joy that even the harvest doesn't produce to the farmer in the midst of a drought and the harvest comes, it's, it's joyful, it's security, it's relief. And David says, but the face of God upon us is more joyful than that. It's more joyful than any momentary uh, 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 feeling you may get. It's more joyful than, 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 than whatever you receive from the food. It's more joyful than whatever you receive from your retail therapy. Because once you finish your retail therapy, your bill coming next week. And now you got another hardship you got to deal with. (laughs) Oh, and by the way, he is saying that while we're being still in a distressful situation and we're seeking God's face and he gives us peace over all of these temporary things, um, he says, then in peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. See how we went right back around the corner from Jeremiah, right? The God of our righteousness will cause us to dwell in security or dwell securely. And he ends this psalm saying, make me dwell in safety again, acknowledging that it is God who is our Savior. You alone allow me, God. You alone give me peace and rest. In the midst of everything that we got going on, Many of us, we can't even sleep well at night. But the implication is that it's not just when you're sleeping, but the implication is that whatever you're going through, when God's face shines upon you, when you place your confidence in him and him alone, there becomes a peace that allows you to rest. It doesn't mean the problem goes away. It just means you're, you're, you're allowed to rest. But all this comes from confidence. That, that, that comes from knowing that, that God is our helper, that God is our strength. And so as we end this series, I pray that you go forward in the confidence, that you go forward in knowing that you can be still and that God will not forsake you. Sure, we have problems. <laughs> but we will not be destroyed if we allow God to fight for us. Only be still and be silent and wait.
I love about worship today is sometimes like, yeah, we we want to go to God and, and we want to carry him all of our stuff. And, and, and we want to bear our burdens and lay them down. And we, we want to give him everything, lay it at his feet pour out our hearts, our emotions, our requests. But sometimes, sometimes if we just, if we just exalt him for who he is, if, if, if we just remember how, how mighty he is and how excellent he is, how perfect he is, how wonderful he is how consistent he is how omnipresent he is how faithful he is how loyal he is if we just exalt him for who he is god god said i am who i say that i am he's he's just everything and sometimes if we first do that when 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 jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray before they made a request he said, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And sometimes just, just going to him and remembering who he is, like, it makes the stuff, the burdens, that much smaller. When we remember how big he is, how amazing he is, how just everything that he is, everything else just like like God I don't even remember what I needed to say to you but but you're good God I got all of this going on but but like you you're, you're enough when we remember we remember how enough he is sometimes we don't even we, we can get to a place where we don't even need to ask him to change a thing because it's just God whatever situation can glorify you however you can be exalted from this God I surrender How, however your name can, can be made known from my pain and my suffering and my sorrows and my burdens like God I surrender I let go of Everything that I think I want out of this life, I, I lay, I lay my life down. We talked about that this week. Like Jesus said, I lay down my life. And sometimes all we need to do is just surrender. So God, I thank you for just for just being who you are. And I thank you, God, for just being amazing to me, God, and still being good in spite of, still being faithful in spite of, still being my joy and my peace in spite of. And so, God, we come to you not asking you to change one thing. For if, if, it, if it needed to be different, you would do it. joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience and let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete and lack nothing so God I don't ask you to change a thing I just ask you to change me change me oh God creating me a clean heart renewing me a right spirit God let my will be let my desires become yours. Help me to look more like you after the, 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 the waves have come, after peace has come, after change has come. Like, let me be different. Because what good is it for you to change my situation if I remain the same? So, God, we give you glory today. We honor you today, God. We worship you. Be 
exalted, God. Be lifted up. Be magnified. Be glorified. Be honored. Be blessed. We love you, God. We thank you, God. It is a privilege to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you guys for... Uh, joining us, man, I pray that uh, this series uh, did something to bless you, and I don't know where you were at in life when we started this series, but hopefully from this series uh, you, you will learn to put in practice um, that, that whole con concept of being still. And listen, there's tons of more verses we could have went through about being silent and being still. I mean, do a Bible study word search and look at those passages, but I just wanted to give you guys something um, in this season to hold on to because, listen, we... You see what's happening in Texas, like 2021 ain't being much more kinder to us than 2020. And so the thing that we need is not better days necessarily. We do, but what we need most importantly is to trust in God so that regardless what the days bring, um, we're not shaken, we're not um, moved. And so I pray that you will be still um, in your life. Listen, do me a favor. If this has blessed you, touched you, like, share, subscribe. Tell somebody about it. Share it with somebody. Um, if you're looking for a church home, man, we would love to have you uh, join us. We're getting ready to, to ramp up to try to get back into in-person services uh, by, by Easter. So we'll be paying attention to that. Um, listen, I love you. Thank you guys for coming to hang out with us. And I pray uh, that I see you here again next week. God bless.